Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. this thing but I want to remind you that we are still in the middle of a fundraiser and the Odyssey Project definitely needs your support with the programs that we are carrying out in the community those of you who have followed me for any stretch of time already know what we do those who need a uh, refreshing or an introduction the organization's official website link is in there but for those of you who know what we do uh, who believe in what I do and have done for years uh, the link to support this organization is in the description box. And if you are one of the cash out people, uh, the organization's cash app account handle is also in the description box. So let's talk. Anybody who has followed me understands that there are certain passions while I have probed uh, the entire spectrum of the black struggle. I have written on trauma. I have written on uh, wealth. I have written, written on almost everything that you can imagine. Uh, I have spoken, I have lectured, uh, I have conducted studies. I've done all of that, um, which lands me here. It's why I'm so passionate because I've worked my entire life to understand the enigma we are facing while providing uh, suggestions and solutions and working with others to build agendas and protocols. That's here. I, I'm not a complainer. I'm not here to talk about what's wrong so we can complain about it. I'm here to talk about what's wrong so that we can address it. And so that's what I've done. But anybody who knows me knows there are a couple of things that I'm immensely passionate about. Number one, black love uh, at the top of the list, uh, black love and uh, taking care of our children because they are the future and how our black boys are consistently left open and vulnerable at a level that is uh, approaching catastrophic. And you hear me talk a lot about proper racial socialization and how it plays a role in empowering young black males to be what they need to be in this world. So I wanted to take some time to explain it. I did an, uh, an interview or a, an episode on the Sunrise Project this past uh, Sunday. The Sunrise Project is uh, an organization that was actually founded by one of my clients when her son uh, attempted suicide. Uh, she wanted to provide a haven for parents whose children were struggling, at that time, particularly young black males who were struggling with either mental illness or addiction. And it has expanded to offer a safe haven for parents who can also come in and be addressed by uh, people who have expertise in different areas. Uh, I have been a resident expert on the, on the uh, podcast for a couple of years. Last year, the OWN Network picked it up and we had to go through a vetting process and everything like that. And so this is my sep second episode with that, uh, with the Sunrise Project since OWN picked it up. And we talked about the importance of r proper racial socializations as a means of building bridges for strong black males and strong black girls, strong black boys and strong black girls. And so some people were confused as to the difference between racial socialization and general socialization. Uh, and so what I want to do is I want to tell you why it's important, uh, how it how it differs from general rate, general socialization and why it's absolutely imperative that every parent does it, not just for their boys, but for their girls as well. 
uh, it helps when you have a system in place that can cover and address everything because every person, every situation, every house has deficiencies. But if there's a system built to address the entire spectrum, then the system covers the deficiencies within the home while strengthening them and ultimately comprehensively preparing the children in the home. So when we talk about socialization as a general concept, what are we talking about? Socialization is the preparation of young children to ultimately grow into pro-social and productive adults in society. Now, as a general rule, in a healthy household, every parent, regardless of race, has to socialize their children. What you're doing is you're teaching them what they do, what they can't do, what they shouldn't do, how they should carry themselves, how they should speak, how to how they should address adults, uh, work ethic, preparation. Uh, the importance of a proper whole holistic education, all of these different things is being inculcated into their psyche from a very early age so that by the time they actually move out into the world and start experiencing it um, outside of the uh, the covering and the protection of the parent, you know, when they start to leave the home by themselves, go play with their friends, all that, they need to already have this started and planted. And uh, they go out into the world and they they develop and they use this. This is the same thing, the same system that families use to project their values into um, uh, into subsequent generations. So if I want my family to have a certain standard, a certain way that they project themselves, present themselves, then it's important for me as a father to teach my progeny, my, my immediate progeny, my, my, my offspring, my, my sons and my daughters, the values. But I must do it at an age where I'm inculcating it, le deeply planning it, planning it into their psyche so that as they grow, they grow in behavior towards the value system. And so when they're older, they simply pass that value system on to their children. And the goal is that these values uh, challenge them to have a strong work ethic, to believe in themselves, to build wealth, to do all the things that are going to be important to enhance and advance the family at a rate that the family becomes bigger, stronger, wealthier as time goes. But it starts in the home. Now, that's socialization on any level. Why, what is racial socialization and why is it, why is it important? Racial socialization is what we have to do as black parents, because here's what happens. The general socialization is you're smart, you're beautiful, you're gorgeous. You can do anything you put your mind to. There's nobody out there in the world better than you. Uh, you don't have to believe you're better than anyone else, but nobody's better than you and all that other stuff. You need to have a strong work ethic. You need to make sure you learn every day, all these things. And you, you but but most of all, you you're remarkable and you're capable. These are the labels you want to give your kids. You're remarkable. You're capable. If you set your mind to, you can do it no matter what's out there. Now, that's the general part. Here's why racial socialization is so important, because the for a black child, the moment they go out into the world outside of the confines of the coverings of their parent, they are immediately going to be hit with stimuli, content, narratives, and behaviors that are contradictory and diametrically in opposition to what their moms and dads, what you have told them about themselves. They're going to go out and their blackness is immediately going to be attacked and challenged. They're going to immediately meet a narrative that says that white is better, that the Eurocentric idea of what's beautiful trumps what your blackness brings to the table. And what you have to do is say no. Uh, if you grew up in the era I grew up in, one of the things that you heard from your parents is that, you know, and, and it started early with me, but fortunately it was well-rounded. So it never became an excuse. It became a challenge. And you've got to be very careful when you are uh, socializing children. But one thing that my mom and my dad told me is that you are going to have to be on average two to three times better than any white man that you come across that's going for the same thing you're going for. Now, they were focusing on jobs because that's where their mindset was. But anything that you're you're uh, uh, anything that you're doing, uh, pursuing contracts, opportunities, there's going to be an advantage that a white person has simply by being white. The system is set up that we are in a white racial caste system. And to ignore that puts us at a disadvantage. Uh, to acknowledge it gives us awareness. To focus on it too much 
makes us powerless. So we've got to be careful. So at the same time that my parents were telling me that I'm going to have to be two and th two or three times better than the, the white man that I'm competing against for any position that I'm going for, they also said, don't worry about it, baby. You are. You are two or three times, but you're that good. You're that good so that when you go out there, you can reach things and excel at a level that's going to still put you out front. You just got to work hard. You got to be focused. You can't take the breaks they take. You can't chill and, and sit back. You don't have it set up for you that way. Everything that you get, you're going to have to go get it. Everything you get, you're going to have to earn. But Here's some here's some things that we have to look at even deeper that goes to the soul. That's the work ethic part. That's the go get the stuff part. Here's the things that you got to be careful about. Things that are directly contributing to a spike in suicide and su suicide, suicidal attempts and suicidal ideations among blacks of all demographics. Here's what it is. Well, that's the work part. But what about. You've told your child, your daughter, she's beautiful. You told your son he's handsome. You told them they were smart. You told them that their hair was lovely. You told them that their complexion was godly. But they go out there and everything light gets better, better traction. Even black people who are lighter get better, better traction. You got to socialize them. Look, you're going to go out there and they're going to tell you that this beautiful dark skin of yours isn't what's up. Trust me, it's what's up. Hey, they're going to go out there and tell you just because you're black, you're not smart as the white kids. You're smarter. You, you've got to be able to properly evaluate them. And then they're going to tell black young black boys, by nature, you're, you're, you're inherently violent. That's why the number one principle, the first and most prevalent principle in black men lead in our socialization program is black men do not cause harm to black women. Why? Because if you can set that standard, if you can set that standard, everything else comes in behind it. A black man is a covering. He's a protection. We teach them that as you become stronger, as a young black boy, you're going to become stronger. That testosterone is going to make you stronger. It's going to make you more muscular. You're going to grow faster and you're going to have a little bit of an edge. You're going to be a little more aggressive than the average female. Why? That the strength and the size is for you to be capable of protecting her and other people who aren't able to protect themselves, the elderly, the women, smaller children. Hey, the aggression is to ensure that when it's time to do it, you're willing. That aggression is that part of you that's like, yeah, do something. That thing is coming for you for a reason. You got to learn how to manage it because it's not for every situation. You got to learn how to control it. It's not to be used and everything, but you must use it to protect others that you care for. And it starts with the female and the children and the elderly. And then you got to protect yourself and your brothers. But hey, check this out. You've got to be willing to do it at any time. It has to be understood that this is the one thing that is my most primitive behavior is to protect. Once I become primitive in my instinctive behavior to protect, I am no longer a threat to the person I'm supposed to be covering the most. I don't care what she does. I don't care how she behaves. I don't care what she says. My instinct is to protect. So I can't see myself doing uh, and moving against my very identity, my identity before it is a provider is a protector. And people say, well, no, this pride. I don't. We have commodified the black man so much that everything around him is judged by how much money he has. Let me tell you something. The black man is built to protect before he is built to provide. Before he has the capacity mentally to go out and earn enough money to take care of a family, he's already physically capable of defending said family. That's how it's, if you can't be a protector, it doesn't matter how much money you have. They're going to come in, take your money and take your family. So we must also instill that in them. We must create a radicalized idea of how important black love is. We also have to do that with the young females. That's part of the socialization. How do you fit in with a man? You can't get to an idea where we're at right now predominantly, where we're at odds with one another because it's easy to point the finger than it is to look inside and say, hey, maybe I didn't do this right. Maybe I should have done that. Maybe part of it is me and be able to be okay with that everybody is looking for someone to blame and when i challenge men i say hey it's not about who did it it's about who's responsible for it and if you call yourself a leader if you call yourself a king then it's your dominion and it's your responsibility i don't care who did it you're responsible for it and so we start from there if if things are chaotic in the kingdom you look at the king so that's the first and foremost thing. If you want to be a king, there's some things come with it that's uncomfortable. Sometimes the queen is cutting up. 
and everybody's sitting up looking. And the easy thing to say is she's a grown woman. She's looking up. No, hold on. What kind of environment is she operating in? Before you made her a queen, did you know she had the potential and proclivity to behave? So hold on. We are going to have to own some stuff on both sides. But why is it so important that we racially socialize our children? Because the world is waiting to redefine them. And if we don't define them, then equip them to be naturally defensive and protective of the identity we've created and given them and that they've embraced that gives them the power to go out into the world. They will reshape it. They will tell them that they're not beautiful. They will tell them that their hair isn't wonderful. They'll have them seeking to assimilate into a Eurocentric idea of what is, a Eurocentric idea of what's beautiful, a Eurocentric idea of what's professional, a Eurocentric idea of what's classy. And then what will happen is they will become so fixated on being accepted by the Eurocentric class that they will start insisting that their brothers and sisters assimilate as well. How many times you see it, somebody's telling them, you shouldn't wear that. That's what's wrong with you. You're wearing, we, 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 we want to be accepted. It's a natural human instinct. The problem is we're trying to be accepted into a situation and a circumstance and an environment that isn't built for us. Matter of fact, it was built to keep us at bay. It was built to protect them and keep us at bay. And as long as we're trying to assimilate into it, we can never walk in power because that's not our source of power. Our source of power is our blackness. Our source of power is our awareness of our history, of our, our heritage, of who we are at our most intimate level. And if we don't teach that to the children, we're failing them. We keep talking about children being the future. We keep talking about how important the children are to the future. Our children, and then we leave them at the mercy of the enemy to develop, to socialize, to identify and all of that. We're, we're, we're dealing with kids with an identity crisis. I talked about this during the session on Sunday. Look, the suicide rate for black males, 14 to 24, up 49% over six years. We're leading in the category of suicides in girls five years old let's just say five years old or 13 because you got two studies one five to 11 the other one uh 10 to 13 those intersect because that's how the studies were done in age groups but you're talking about five to 13 these babies are killing themselves they literally we literally lead in that category now girls five to age 13. social media is telling them who they are and what they should be and they don't measure up to it based on who they really are and they're trying to fit into something that was a study done two years ago and it showed and facebook knows because facebook owns instagram that instagram is one of the most dangerous uh spaces for teenage girls because they're still trying to discover who they are and it's painting images and pictures that are unrealistic and it's putting them in a space where they're literally killing themselves because they don't have enough likes or they lost uh, their subscribers or they lost their channel. All this stuff that's happening is crazy. We had a situation where young, <clears throat> two young black beauty queens, beauty pageant winners jumped from buildings within the last year. struggling identity crisis. One of the biggest things I deal with with clients that come to me under the age of 25 is identity crisis. Trying to discover who you are in a world that wants to define you based off of how they can manipulate and exploit you. They're not trying to empower you. They're trying to position you to where they can get the most out of you while giving you the least. And we have to prepare our children to do what's necessary to not be pulled into that, to, to lean into their blackness, to lean into their beauty, to lean into their intellectual giftedness, to lean into their creativity and their imagination, to understand that anything that they ever desire is within their grasp to, to create. Because if they can imagine it and conceive it in their mind, it's God's evidence that it's possible, but you gotta put it in their heads because there are people out there trying to pull it out. You gotta, you gotta plan it deeply and you gotta protect it. You have to protect it. People wonder why I'm so passionate about black men lead. 
because if we don't create a rite of passage that effectively racially socializes our young black males, we're going to continue to lose them to a broken education system that herds them into uh, an expanding prison system and then institutionalizes them into criminalistic behavior that they never shake. Do you realize that 72% of men who leave prison recidivate? The system isn't set up to re rehabilitate. It's set up to exploit their labor, to exploit the fact that they can get $40,000 a year per inmate. Just for the inmate being in there, they're getting $40,000 a year. Then whatever work, do you realize there are companies hiring prisons for, for inmates to do customer service? You know, sometimes you're calling in to speak to a customer service agent. You're speaking to an inmate. Do you realize that? Do you realize that some of the best furniture in this country, the most exceptional and quality made furniture is being made in prisons? Pennies on the dollar. Slavery by another name. The big brother to convict leasing. And we have the ability and the capacity to prepare our children that in a way that reduces the risk. Here's, here, here's what I can tell you about proper racial socialization. Proper racial socialization increases mental health, improves mental health, enhances mental health. It uh, increases and improves confidence. It reduces the risk of dropping out of school before you get your diploma, which again, reduces the risk of going to prison. Here's the one I love. It reduces the risk of committing violence. And in a situation where we are seeing intimate partner violence and intimate partner homicide uh, climb, that's something that everybody should be wanting to see is a reduction in black men harming black women. So we can talk about it all day long, but at some point we're going to either sit down and do something about it. We're not, or as my grandparents were saying, excuse my French, piss or get off the pot. It's time to stop talking about it. It's top time to stop whining and complaining about it. It's time to stop sitting up and having all of this information in front of us and doing nothing with it. You look at the Jews, you look at the Asians, you look at the Arabs, you look at Latinos, they have rite of passages. Their young boys understand absolutely together we stand. And so you're looking at all these groups and one of the things they have is a rite of passage. The young males in these groups have an understanding of who they are and what the group, the race, the enclave is going to expect from them and what they're going to be held accountable to. One of the problems, the biggest problems that I found when I was creating Black Man Lead was there was no true standard for Black manhood. Everybody was defining manhood based on their strengths, based on what they did good. You know, uh, people with people with good jobs, you know, being a provider. You know, people who uh, was, you know, real good at loving on the kids and being a good father. And it was hardly ever you saw someone put it all together and say, hey, you need to be a protector. You need to be a provider. You need to be a promoter of what's in your home, meaning you need to elevate the identity and the self-confidence of the people in your home, starting with the wife and with the children. Every day they should hear something good about themselves. Every day they should be lifted up and told how awesome they are. That's a part of it. You need to be a priest. What does that mean? That means you need to stand before God consistently on a regular place. Your priesthood is immensely important to your ability to be able to lead and head a home. Then you need to be a prophet. What does that mean? Do you? I need to be able to tell the future. No, you need to be a prophet in the sense that you are speaking into the lives of the people in your home. You need to be speaking into the life of your wife. You need to be speaking into the life of your children. You need to be elevating them, telling them not only what you believe about them, but speaking it into you are going to have a great day. You are going to be successful in business. You are going to be successful in your schoolwork. You are going to come out of this and you're going to excel in what you do. You've got to be able to do that. That's manhood. It, 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 it isn't about being perfect. It's about being engaged. It's about being committed. It's about saying that as I come into the challenge, I'll grow to meet it. I may not be there yet, but I'm growing to meet it. And your family should be able to look at you and see the energy you're investing in becoming good enough to be everything they need. They should be able to see it so that 
then they can assimil assimilate into it. Your daughters will look for men like you. Your sons will want to become you. Your wife will embrace you and engage you. You are responsible for creating the environment. But where are we starting at? You can't wait till you get 16 to tell him that. You can't wait till he's 21 to insist on he doing it. You're going to have to put it in his mind so he's literally yearning to be it before he ever even reaches puberty. This is where we're at as a people. We're at a place where we are more comfortable being uncomfortable then we are committed to building a power source and a power structure to where we can demand that they get their foot off our necks. We keep sending our children out into a world that's designed to destroy them, unprepared, half broken, unsure of themselves, angry, frustrated, and then we want to know why they are doing what they're doing. Really? How much have we invested in them? And here's the other problem. Those of you who've got it down and you're doing a great job, you're satisfied with just that. You don't understand how the connectivity of us as a community is what creates the power. You don't understand that no matter how well you've done them and how well around that they get, they become isolated when they get out there because their own people don't understand them because they're operating on a different frequency and the other people are still not going to accept them. So now they're more isolated than ever. We need the community. Nobody else is out there operating without a community. Nobody else is out there operating on an individualized mindset and winning. Everybody, no matter how they feel about each other, has a system in place to where their group benefits as a whole, except us. And this is something that we have to conquer if we're ever going to talk about. We have to build as as together we stand put. We've got to learn. We have to start building a nation, a nation that understands who we are, that has a clear code of conduct, that has a clear blueprint of how to reach empowerment, that is function and control by protocols and not emotions. That there's a fixation on awareness. We don't win because we don't even know how to play the game. We are unaware. You've heard me say this. I don't know how many times we keep losing because we don't know how things work. It's our responsibility to develop an understanding of how things work. When you understand how things work, then you can start to look at the mechanisms and the movements and how they are operating and, and how they're impacting you. And then you design movements and counter moves to, 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 to circumvent them, to overcome them, to push them back and eventually develop power to where you can also apply pressure. But if you never understand how things work, you keep getting hit, you keep getting frustrated. You keep starting over, you keep getting frustrated. You keep losing, you keep getting frustrated, but your frustration is not what's going to produce the answer. Your knowledge and your application of that knowledge is. It's absolutely no way we have the mechanisms in place to empower our children and we're not doing it. So when people ask, well, what do you mean by racial socialization? That's what I mean, is that every kid is socialized, no matter what race. Our kids have to be racially socialized to prepare them for their blackness and how it will be perceived and how people will counter what you've told them about themselves. And they have to be prepared for it or they will go into shock. That's important. When you can't embrace who you are, it's because you haven't been properly socialized. When self-hate exists, it's because you haven't been properly socialized. When there's a turn in of aggression towards one another, it's because you haven't been properly socialized. I'm telling you, there's so much power in it, but we're failing to do it. On that note, look, I'm finished. I'm done. Uh, I had to get that to you. Um, again, that was a big part of the question on Sunday's event. Uh, when I do get that footage, I'm going to share it with you guys so you can check it out. Uh, but I had to get it to you again. Um, we are prepared to do some pretty extraordinary things with Black Men Lead and um, a couple of other uh, 
things we have going on with the young female population. Uh, and I'm trying to work out exactly how that's going to go moving forward. Uh, but we're definitely working on that. We definitely have the capacity to meet it. Uh, we also have picked up a new partner that's going to work with us with young women who are battered, uh, who are abused, who have been abused as children and in domestic relationships. I'm excited about that. And so we are going all out and <clears throat> We need your support. So again, the link for you to support what we're doing is in the description box. Uh, if you like the Cash App route, the organization's Cash App handle is in the description box. Let's make moves. If you have young boys or young girls that you want uh, to uh, be a part of what we're doing, reach out. If you have a capacity to love and help and you think you will be a resource, reach out. We need all the help we can get. There is no wrong way to reach out, but we definitely are going to have to have resources. Uh, no one else is doing anything with no resources. And to think, to think that the people who are least empowered can do it with no resources is really ridiculous. We need the resources more than anyone else uh, so that we can achieve a level of power, but we have to start now. With that being said, look, I'm gonna get off here. I still have work to do because I have my responsibilities. But anyway, look, Thank you for stopping by and listening. I hope that you will subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. I hope that you would share it so that other people can learn from it and other people can be aware of it and hit that like button. On that note, I am out.